Hello and welcome to episode three of EMS Nation, EMS Journal Club, where you get to join us as we go in depth during our weekly journal club sessions. You'll have the pleasure and privilege of meeting Dr. Mark Merlin, an EMS physician in New Jersey State, as well as our EMS fellows, Dr. Amandeep Tagore and Dr. Navin Arya Prakai, as they discuss two exciting articles. First, Trinexamic acid as part of remote damage control resuscitation in the pre-hospital setting, a critical appraisal of the medical literature, which was published in the Journal of Trauma and Acute Kit Surgery in June of 2015. And then subsequently, we'll move on to another very exciting topic, saving life and brain with extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation, a single center analysis of in-hospital cardiac arrest, a study performed at Thomas Jefferson University on their series of in-hospital cardiac arrests and patients who received ECMO. As with all journal club discussions, it's optimal to read the article prior to launching into our conversation, and we will have those linked in the show notes. So if you are not sitting in the car, take five to ten minutes, pull up the article, and um, at least read through some of the uh, preliminary statistics they present. And as always, we are incredibly passionate about pre-hospital research. There is much more content than we're able to include simply on this podcast. Please follow us on Twitter at EMS underscore nation and join along as we live tweet our journal clubs every single Monday where we review the most relevant articles published in the pre-hospital literature with the hashtag EMSJC, EMS Journal Club. Enjoy! So this is a, uh, a review article basically published in uh, Trauma and Acute Care Surgery, uh, published this year, uh, 2015. Essentially, it's looking at uh, TXA as a part of a remote damage control resuscitation in the pre-hospital setting, and really looking just uh, at some of the medical literature that's out there and looking at you know what are some of our alternatives and kind of what's kind of uh, some of the side effects of TXA if there are any, and uh, what's the utility of it. Uh, Pre-hospitally, you know, typically when we think about uh, you know TXA, it's a derivative of an amino acid, uh, lysine. It hinders uh, plasmolysis uh, by inhibiting the activation of plasminogen to plasma. That's kind of the, really the mechanism of action for TXA. It basically strengthens the clots and, and reduces bleeding. So that's really kind well, of. Let's add to that by saying in this month's issue of Shock, the journal. They did this amazing study that only the abstract has come out so far. I'm waiting for the paper with great anticipation where they not only talk about the plasminogen plasmin uh, molecule being broken apart by the lysine receptor, they talk about how it helps clot strength, which is what we didn't think it would ha- it helped initially. And they talked about a benefit during the hyperfibrinolysis period, a benefit to ATC, which is acute traumatic coagulopathy, and clot strength. So the, the mechanism is probably much better than we ever anticipated before. Um, and that's, I'm waiting for that article to come out from Shock. It's actually ePubs October. In addition to that, we have this kind of coming up down the pike as well. So, you know, the military has been using TXA for quite some time now. When we look at, like, you know, probability of death from battle injury, significantly reduced from uh, 25% from before down to 15% or less. A lot of this is, like, you know, due to, like, just kind of newer interventions, tactical combat casualty care, and a lot of... Uh, in incorporation of like medicine really with, with uh, combat uh, medicine as well. But 90% of all you know, battlefield fatalities die before reaching a surgical facility. 25% of these deaths were retrospectively deemed to be potentially survivable. So there's a good amount that we can still save uh, really with aggressive uh, hemorrhagic control. And you know, uh, 90% of those cases of the 25% when we look at it w- could have been potentially survived by hemorrhagic control. And so that's kind of what we're looking at. It's that the, the term that this article uses is uh, remote damage control resuscitation, RDCR. And that's a concept that they're trying to kind of bring in. And it's really basically uh, looking at the clinical picture of a hypotensive patient and hemostatic resuscitation and kind of using that as an endpoint to kind of decide how you're going to resuscitate the patient uh, appropriately. This really kind of, uh, this article... There's been a lot of studies that have been shown, like copper studies and stuff, that have kind of looked at like TXA in general. But really, kind of what this kind of uh, article is trying to really kind of talk about or review really is the pre-hospital environment and whether you know what are some options for hemostatic intervention, 
the data supporting efficacy of TXA early, and then uh, safety data, so basically like side effect profile, and then reports of TXA in the pre-hospital setting. So when we look at like just, you know, antifibrinolytic agents that are available, you know, we, we have TXA, there's another one that's called Aprotinin. Uh, this was taken off the market uh, in 2007. It's been slightly brought back uh, in Europe, however, it's not in, in the United States. And then you have like uh, another amino acid, uh, amino carboric acid that's also used. But TXA by and large is kind of what we've been using. Uh, lots of, you know, sur surgical interventions are really when it was primarily initially used, TXA around uh, you know, the globe. Uh, orthopedic OB, we see it routinely used. And a lot of the data that we've extrapolated really is from these surgical cases and looking at, uh, you know, perioperative blood transfusions in, in these countries. And a lot of these are like from developing countries where, you know, you, they're, they're trying to limit the amount of blood that they're giving to patients. Again, uh, that's kind of where we are from here. You've got also like these recombinant activity factors like CAPT7, uh, PCC, uh, and all these other things that you can use pre that uh, that we kind of discuss about possible, you know, hemorrhagic control. However, these may sometimes predispose you to, to thrombosis. This study itself, they're looking at basically what are some of the available data that they're looking at. So you've got a couple of data that they or, or trials that they've looked at. So there's 2012 meta analysis of surgical trials involving TXA. That's uh, 129 trials that included uh, about uh, a little over 10,000 patients. Again, these were mostly elective surgery trials, the majority in cardiac surgery, and then uh, you know, again, we're looking at blood transfusion, risk of blood transfusion, and then looking at TXA when used, and using it against a control group of transfused. Uh, and they, you know, they did see that blood transfusion was significantly reduced uh, up to about 38% uh, in the TXA group, which is huge. They also have 2014 retrospective analysis of about uh, 800, a little over 800,000 patients who underwent like total hip knee arthroplasty during a six year period in the US hospitals. And, um, and you saw that the need for transfusion uh, in the TXA group was almost half. So a huge reduction in, in the amount of patients that needed uh, blood transfusion. So, you know, the data is definitely out there. It's very supportive. Uh, of you know using TXA and using it to to prevent uh, really transfusion. When we look at trauma, TXA there's a very large placebo controlled double blind randomized trial study about twenty thousand trauma patients. This was like a crash two trial, very good trial that we kind of have out there, and basically it looked at you know TXA in uh, hemorrhagic control. And essentially the way that this kind of protocol was set up, that you gave a gram of TXA over ten minutes. And then you gave another gram over eight hours, and this significantly reduced mortality, basically 14.5% versus 60% without any type of intervention. So this was based on like a very, like I said, goal-directed kind of therapy. The, there was an absolute risk reduction of like 15 fewer deaths per 100,000 um, that we saw. So, you know, good numbers. And one thing that this kind of trial really kind of focused on and looked at was really kind of like the timing of kind of when TXA was given. And one interesting finding that they had was that if you gave TXA three hours after a trauma, uh, you were actually uh, increasing the mortality uh, by causing bleeds more than 40%. However, if you gave TXA you know, within an hour to three hours, you were actually decreasing the mortality by a fifth. So, you know, 20% reduction you know, of the mortality if, if TXA is given prior to three hours. And obviously, we, we feel that it should be done Kind of what this comes from is like the quarter an hour, what we talk about is the one hour. But basically, you know, TXAs in these studies have shown that there's a reduction of blood loss associated with TXA, and it, you know, it, it's a great, great study. So it's a very, very large uh, study, randomized, double line randomized trial. It's one of the largest ones that we've had to date. So I think it's, it's really, really good. And then when we look at like war surgeries, there's like a Matters 1 and Matters 2 study uh, that was done. Again, it's a, it's a good study, included about 1,300 patients looking at blood transfusions uh, and then looking at uh, the treatment of TXA and prior precipitate. Again, you know, these are all pre-surgical kind of settings, and again, TXA did show, you know, there wasn't any statistical significance, but there wasn't any harm either. There are civilian studies that were done, so civilian trauma studies where you looked at TXA and um, there wasn't really any benefit. Uh, not really benefit, but there weren't any changes. But however, that being said, this wasn't these. There were like two studies that were civilian studies that were done, 
I, I personally think, and that kind of the, the author of this article also believe that these probably studies aren't really justified. Although there was no significant, you know, realized, the problem is, is that the patients that were given TXA were of a much more sicker population, and they were hemodynamically more unstable, required uh, significant more surgical intervention versus the patient, you know, population that did not require TXA. So it's hard to make that call when you don't have the same level of acuity in patients. That being said, if you think about it, you have a higher acuity of patients, a sicker population that actually needs, you know, aggressive, uh, you know, hemorrhagic control, and there was no change in mortality. So that speaks volumes as well. So, you know, you can't really, you can't, you know, they did do a multivariate analysis, and it didn't show statistical significance. However, I think it does speak volumes that, at least that you know that with TXA, you, with the critical patients, you didn't see any significant change either, or, or at least drop. So that's kind of the article, that's kind of some publication that you see with TXA, you know, we have the military, you have trauma, you have surgical, and then you have some community small ones that again, aren't probably the best ones to really look at. Um, but all in all, you know, it gives pretty much TXA, you know, a, a, a green light as far as a good agent to use for uh, hemorrhagic control. So for safety, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, talk about, you know, does this cause thrombo you know, thrombosis? Can this increase your risk of the TPE? Um, and, 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 it, and it seems that it doesn't. However, you know, the literature is a little scarce in these types of things. And there's a lot of studies that don't look at kind of these, this data set as well. However, um, there's a recent analysis that concludes the effects of TSC on risk of vascular occlusive events is uncertain. So that's kind of where we are. There's, there have been large studies that have been done but it doesn't really add much to kind of our thought process. But there's a very, very low instance of reported thrombotic events. So when we look at, you know, changes in trial, 0.4% versus 0.5% in TXA versus non-TXA groups. So no statistical significance. So we're not seeing any greater incidence or any, any lower incidence of, of th thrombosis. So I, I think that for the most part, it seems to be a very safe drug to use. And again, same thing with like DVTs, the, the numbers are pretty much almost the same. I think that's pretty much the main things that they kind of talk about. I think really the biggest thing is, is that, you know, there are some, you know, the British military, the Israeli defense uh, forces are also using this quite uh, readily. The forces are also using like fresh frozen plasma as well and, and, and whole blood, or I'm sorry, packed red blood cells in, in the pre hospitally So there's a lot more stuff that they're using. But from, from our perspective, I think that TXA is, is a great drug to use, and, and it should be primarily probably used in that golden hour. So within one hour of kind of traumatic injury where you have a patient who's hypotensive, tachycardic, and hemorrhagic shock, you know, their, their best bet's going to get TXA immediately, and you see great uh, outcome data on that. So right now, there's, you know, kind of what this kind of study concludes is that Basically, you know, TXA is very efficacious uh, with heme good hemostatic efficacy. Uh, and the CRASH-2 trial really kind of shows that, that there's great survival benefit. Again, within the first three hours, but we talk about the first hour, there's no other pharmacological option other than TXA right now. And uh, I think, you know, this is a great drug to use, and we should probably use it a lot more often uh, when it presents itself. I think that was really good. The, the two studies we're waiting for, uh, one is called the PATCH trial, the other is the CRASH-3 trial, so we're waiting for some more perspective data. But, you know, they looked at the surgical literature and were very impressed. You, while we like to give the second dose in the hospital, if they don't, that's okay. And, um, you know, I, I think this drug should be on every paramedic unit in, in the world. Um, I think we have enough literature to say that uh, you, you should be giving this. The harder question is going to be now, what about for people with like the GI bleeds when even Cochrane is now starting to turn in and support this? Um, but obviously, GI bleeds typically just can be driven to the hospital right away, whereas in trial trauma patients can't. <coughs> I think um, another issue of potential controversy is with more and more prospective data that TXA has benefit. A similar challenge that we faced with the entire longboard issue. In other words, we know the right thing is not to longboard patients because that confers harm. But how do you then uh, interface with trauma centers that don't buy into that philosophy, right? So similarly with TXA, we have more and more prospective data that says early administration confers the greatest amount of benefit. Um, so we want to be giving it pre-hospitally for hypotensive trauma patients. 
Now, how do you address when the trauma center does not necessarily believe in TXA or won't give the second dose? <clears throat> well, I think it's okay. You know, they certainly our realm is a pre-hospital setting, particularly for people who are delayed or uh, on scene for whatever reason. You know, um, John Holcomb said when he was interviewed by Scott Weingart that his only problem with the drug is he doesn't understand how a drug can help people in under one hour so significantly and hurt them after three hours. Mm -hmm. And that was a crash two data where the odds ratio is slightly to the left of, of zero after three hours and to the right be before under one hour. And I think the answer, although nobody knows for sure, is that it has something to do with the hyperfibrinolytic period and the acute traumatic coagulopathy of trauma, right? So these trauma patients get DVTs and PEs because of this period where they're clotting more after the trauma not just because they're lying in the bed for a couple of days, right? I don't know that anybody has that answer, but we'll see if that uh, pans out with more literature. But with, what, 129 studies in the surgical literature, it's pretty impressive. I mean, Amon did mention the, the FFP, adding the FFP. You know, I think once we get uh, freeze-dried plasma approved for everyone, we'll be giving that, like, water in the pre-hospital yeah. setting. We just don't have the approval yet. Um, the military certainly can do it, and they're doing a good job with it. But, you know, FFP is very difficult to carry routinely in a pre-hospital setting, just like blood. And we've been waiting for a perfect a solution in a pre-hospital setting and gotten very close, but it still has eluded us. But free strike plasma will probably be the answer. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next trial. Good job. Hey, hey Doc, just real quick. Is there anything, uh, any of these studies, you mentioned so many of them, under 16 at them? Yeah, the so our, our New Jersey protocol is terrible. Right. It's absolutely terrible. And I presented last week to the state uh, my version of what the protocol would be at the MAC meeting. So 60 was based upon crash 2 data, right? Mm -hmm. Terrible. Uh, 15 was what matters showed. Um, the Petrex article came out, the mean age for this pediatric um, TSA, their mean age was 11. And not only was it 11, but did they, they didn't give weight-based TXA. They gave big adult doses to these little kids. And you know what happened to them? Nothing. Big adult doses, a thousand milligrams, even to little kids, mean age of 11, and they didn't have any increased risk of DVTs or PEs. And I believe they had one patient down to the age of three. So when I, when, when I suggest a new protocol, which you're writing up now, I suggested that their age have nothing to do with this. It has nothing to do with this. This should be a discussion <coughs> between the paramedic and the physician about giving it, based upon meeting the criteria, and that's it. And it should be based upon heart rate and blood pressure and any trauma between basically the neck and the mid-thigh, um, that blunt are penetrating with signs of uh, internal or external bleeding, period. And that's it, nice and simple. So the protocol we have now is just too, too cumbersome and really doesn't make any sense. So hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll change that. But 16 is an old, old number. It was old when the protocol came out. Mm -hmm. But Petrex clearly showed you can, you can give it a kid with no issue. And if you look online, I looked like a week or two ago, there are many pediatric trauma centers around the world who have pediatric TXA protocols. All right, let's go to the ECMO trial. So the ECMO trial is saving life and brain with an extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation, a single center analysis of in-hospital cardiac arrest. So everybody's writing about ECMO nowadays. Yeah, so this is specifically looking at in-house cardiac arrest, so it's not in pre-hospital specifically. Um, came out in, around March 2005. In this study, they looked between 2010 to 2014. They wanted to see whether or not the eCPR ECMO uh, made a difference. There was uh, 107 uh, eCPR cases. They specifically, it seemed like they make a they made a protocol to establish to make this happen, but it was still not an actual study. It was a retrospective review of uh, the data that they, re they they received from this. They had an exclusion criteria. Um, first, what happened is the uh, physician in charge of the code blue in-house would go and determine whether ECMO was even feasible within 20 minutes of unsuccessful resuscitation. Exclusion criteria included age greater than 70, presence of a DNR, whether the patient had uncorrectable baseline disease like cancer, CAD, uh, previous neurological deficit, um, they would then notify the on-call uh, CTICU attending who would also discuss the case and they would together determine whether or not ECMO should be started. They didn't have 24-hour coverage, so that kind of excluded a lot of patients right away. Uh, resuscitate, they had a 
uh, perfusionists on call at nights, and they had uh, nocturnist interventionalists on uh, four out of the seven nights, so they weren't the primary intensivists in the area. Of them, all the patients received uh, hypothermia protocol as well. So there, they had a total of 23 patients, 15 male, 8 female, who underwent the extracorporeal uh, resuscitation. They were all on the hypothermia protocol like we talked about. They were on it for about six days, plus or minus five days. Nine died while on the EPC, the ECMO. And of the others, they had an, some had anoxic brain injury, presumably from the CPR beforehand. The stroke, four, four had strokes, uh, one had bowel necrosis. If you go to table one, they also looked at the organ function before and after ECMO, and it seemed like it didn't really change that much. Uh, they looked at creatinine, AST, lactate. In table two, the demographics of the patients, it, although it's a low end value, uh, the age was around 45 for both uh, survivors and non-survivors. Nothing really stands out. Of the people who had uh, complications, I mean, with the low end value, you really can't say anything. The only thing that had a significant key value was really neurological complications, and they were all of the people who are the non-survivors. The one thing that they did get from this was that they were able to um, procure organs more which is not a terrible thing. I think it's still very early um, with the ECMO because we don't know who who to choose, who, who, who is this going to help. But until we get the process down to the point where you just call someone real very quickly, you establish within 5-10 minutes whether or not this person needs it and go through with doing the ECMO itself, we're not going to be able to say whether or not it's helpful or not. I think there's some centers where you automatically put in a... Uh, thermal catheter right away as soon as the patient comes in and through that you can actually uh, do VB ECMO. In this case they did VA ECMO which is venous to arterial ECMO uh, but you don't necessarily need to do that and more and more people are becoming trained in how to perform ECMO so it's a fairly simple procedure but very big vessels and you can bleed out a lot of it but I think that you know the average uh, ER physician can definitely do this with a little bit of training. There was a case in uh, in Europe where they did ECMO in the field, or was that the uh, in France? In France. Yeah, there's about ten cases. A uh, published paper about ten cases in France and Germany. We've had uh, multiple cases. The emergency departments around the country, at least some of them, are are doing this more more routinely with no big change in survivor rates, but better harvest organs and 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 a few people who miraculously walk out of the hospital alive. But, How uh, expensive this? So I just oh. did it two or three weeks ago in the ER for a forty-year-old, some uh, some forty-year-old guy who um, was in cardiac arrest, who was stented three days before. I think it was his LEP was stented when he came into cardiac arrest. Uh, we got a ROSC, and then he just kept coding, so he could go to cath lab. He just kept coding back and forth, back and forth. You know, we called the heart failure guy. I mean, we just we put in a balloon pump right away. That was easy. And then we called the heart failure guy, and he just did echo at the bedside, right in the ER. And it was pretty simple. I mean, it was during the day, so everybody was in the house, including the perfusionist. So really, the guy was probably at the bedside like in ten minutes with everything. I mean, the balloon pump we put in like in five minutes. The guy was going to go to the cath lab because there's what he needed, and we detoured him to CAT scan, and they had like a huge bleed. Unfortunately, so that was the really limiting step. We brought him back to the ER. He had an intracranial bleed. Yeah. In fact, that three days before, if we had included his stent, it would have been a straightforward case. You know, the, the, we said, you know, the next guy will live. But, you know, her, she has something in their ER where they push a button and, the, and they can go get ECMO in the ER right away. And more and more people are doing this now and everybody's writing about this. I think, you know, it's going to be hard because, hey, you nobody's know, going to have good ECMO services after hours. And no perfusionist ever sleeps in the hospital. But the ER can put the catheters in that's easy. Start the process and then call the perfusion instead. I think the uh, the nuance in this article, which was uh, something I haven't heard um, in the editorialization of ECMO, is the organ trans uh, organ ability to harvest the organs. And I think that was remarkable that they said that there was no continued organ dysfunction once the patient patients were placed in ECMO, which allowed for multiple organs to be harvested. Additionally, it gives time the family time to sort of come to a natural close with the passing of their relative and elect to make the transplantation decision, which can certainly be a harrowing one in the moment. 
but if the patient's on ECMO, we said average for six days or so, they have anoxic brain injury and you have time to judiciously approach the patient and the ramifications for organ transplantation can be pretty interesting. Right. You know, it's interesting. Our patient had no blood pressure and when we started the ECMO, and he coded 10 times, he went to 70 over 30, stayed there, and never coded again, hmm. and stayed 70 over 30. And he kept, he went in and out of the pack several times, but we just elected to do nothing because he wasn't going into cardiac arrest. And we gave him, we maxed out a multiple antidiarrhythmics, nothing really worked great. Yeah, I mean, we might have more people into ICUs who, who were CCUs who are not going to survive, but we might have more organs. But I'm not sure we do a great job getting organs anyway from the emergency departments. I think overall in the entire American healthcare system, we do a poor job, and we contrast that to Europe where these conversations are actually had by the provider and the patient prophylactically. People are serious when they say they want to be organ donors, etc. And the harvesting process is integrated into the healthcare system, whereas sort of for us, more often than not, it's an afterthought. Right. Or a box that we need to check off on the death certificate. I mean, I've been in some places where DNRs are, if you ask people about DNRs when they come into the ER, they all have a discussion with their PMGs. And in other places, it seems like very few people. It it seems to be like a geographic thing to me. Like some places do it well, some places don't do it well. Uh, Even patients I've had on hospice, they haven't talked really about, don't you have one? And some of them don't even know. Right. There are a couple things about this article that I found interesting. One is that the time, average time to deployment of ECMO is like 54 minutes. And that, I think that's probably a long time. I mean, long. I, I think... For you know, somebody in cardiac arrest. Yeah, someone in cardiac arrest and you're going to look at studies and you're going to do ECMO at 54 minutes in hospital. I think that's probably too late when you're looking at how much you know, CPR you're doing was a good CPR during the entire 50 minutes. Looking at that outcome data is a little bit difficult to do. The other thing about this is that I find interesting is that, you know, I do see that they, you know, had a number of cardiac arrests. They had 23 patients, but that being said, they had like two patients who were in the OR from a cabbage. So doing the cabbage, these patients going to cardiac arrest after perfusion. I mean, I don't know if that's the patient you want to like look at and you do outcomes data on. I mean, I don't think that patient should have been probably those two patients should be included in the data set because your your survival rate, you know, 30 percent now is brought down to like 25 or so. You know, basically just with taking those two patients out. And should they be included if they're, you know, one, they're having a cabbage and now they're going to cardiac arrest and then you're doing ECMO on them? I don't know. I think the typical patient that we're considering there is, is not someone that's on the table. So maybe somebody you know, who hits the door who doesn't have a whole lot of comorbidity should be a potential ECMO candidate right away. The one thing I thought that was interesting that they had in here was looking at like their metal sofa Apache scores to kind of guide whether or not. When should we, how long should we take this out? And how long should we be really doing, you know, ECMO on somebody? At least they're, they're trying to figure out, like, when do we call it? How long do we keep ECMO going? So it had some good points, but, uh, you know, I think that kind of starting ECMO sooner, uh, some of these in-hospital cardiac arrests is probably not a bad thought. Um, I think that one of the issues with ECMO, ECMO, and we discuss with experts in the field, which there are a growing number of, in fact, should we plug the reanimate conference coming up in San Diego in February by Weingart and some of the folks out at Sharp Memorial in San Diego, is that patient selection is something that we don't know very much about. In other words, who would be the ideal patient for initiation of ECMO? Uh, and I think the nuanced piece, again, in this article that was very interesting is the organ transplantation or the prospect for uh, uh, harvesting transplantable organs takes that up out of the conversation a little bit in the sense that, well, if I have a patient that may be amenable to therapy, I can certainly try them on ECMO, see what happens, and yes, they may have a complete intact neurological recovery. The downside now is also potentially mitigated in the sense that my the family of the uh, patient has time to one see them come to uh, acceptance with the death and grieving process, and they can have an educated conversation about transplantable organs now. So the downside now is put somebody on ECMO that may not survive. Well, at least we can still get organs. Right for huge costs. The cost is a yeah, different issue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you still have a lack of... I talked to the orphan procurement guy a couple of days ago who runs, I forget, but the guy who's in charge of it, and he, you know, and, and he was saying that they're now training more and more people in ECMO for this purpose. 
We certainly hope you enjoyed that rousing discussion regarding TXA and remote damage control resuscitation, as well as ECMO in in in-hospital cardiac arrest. We'd love to hear your opinions, thoughts, sentiments, especially if they disagreed with ours. And we'd love for you to join the conversation online. Please do follow us at Twitter and ping us with your thoughts and comments. If you'd like to go back in time and review all the articles that we have discussed in Journal Club on Twitter, please check out hashtag EMSJC or EMS Journal Club. This is Faison Arshad wishing everyone a safe tour.